if you want to go back through them up to November 5th, I think. So I'll have these all uploaded before, before long here. Okay, so we're cooking along here. So here's where we are. Here's where we left off. We left off talking about polarity. So let's practice what we know. Let's put this into practice. Here you have two molecules. If I asked you on an exam, if I asked you on a quiz, if I asked you on a worksheet, is that molecule on the left polar? Is that molecule on the right polar? The only way you're going to be able to assess that is to be able to do a Lewis dot structure, to do a molecular or electron, electron domain geometry, a molecular geometry, and see if your symmetry is off or on. Okay? So how do we do that? Um, let's get rid of Billy Rubin. So what happens when we first when we first uh, see a molecule like this, we say we see chlorine with three fluorines. So I know that I'm going to have four times separate. I'm going to have 28 electrons. Okay? So I have to account for 28 electrons. Did I do it right? Yeah. So which one of those is going to be the central atom? Chlorine or fluorine? Why chlorine? Because it has a lower electronegativity than fluorine. So chlorine is a central atom in this. I'm going to go put my fluorines around. And how many have I accounted for? What's three times eight? What's three times eight? 24. So how many electrons am I missing? I'm missing four, which means that chlorine is going to put a lone pair there and a lone pair there. So how many electron domains are coming off of, of, off of chlorine? Five. So what is this electron domain geometry? Trigonal, bipyramidal. Okay. So its electron domain geometry is trigonal, pyramidal. Okay. What is its molecular geometry? What is it? T shape. Because remember, it puts these around the equator, puts these on the axial, so these are ignored, so that one's sticking out there, and that's sticking out there, and that makes a T-shape. So its molecular geometry is T-shape. Okay? Is it a polar molecule? And why? Well, you, you have to remember this, yeah, I mean, I, you could rationalize that, but here's the easier way to do it. Since this has an, uh, an electronegativity of 3.0, this has an electronegativity of 4.0, and this is 3.0, right? I am pulling in that direction. These are polar vectors heading in that direction. So you're pulling away from that chlorine. Not only that, but these lone pairs don't cancel out that pole. So it is a polar molecule. If, if I had this, now it's not correct up here, but if I had this, now that would be a nonpolar molecule, right? Because now the equator has all the same pole, different than the axial. But going back to our actual molecule, we're not quite done yet. So it is polar. But what is my hybridized orbital? What are my, what's my hybrid orbital? What is it? SP3D. SP3D, excellent. So this becomes SP3D. Okay? So that's where we should be. Now, what we're going to talk about in the next 15, 20 minutes is, is where, what does this actually look like? When I say SP3D, what am I actually talking about? Where does that come from? Well, notice chlorine, because it sits on the third level down, we have our principal quantum number of three, so I have that. 3D that I can move into, which is where that comes from. That's the 3D. So for chlorine, this is my 3S, my 3P, and my 3D. And it can put electrons and mix those at will. So with that, we see that when I have something like a tetrahedron, where does the tetrahedron come from? Well, I talked about carbon on, on Wednesday, my favorite atom, and talked about how it takes an S orbital 
and three p orbitals, and it begins to mix them. Now this is really important. It mixes them because when you look, when you look at your quantum levels, n equals one, n equals two. If you look at n equals one, it's down here, one s orbital, and you look at n equals two, it's the two s orbital and the two p orbitals. Okay. Remember, S's have one orbital that can hold two electrons. P's have three orbitals that can hold six electrons. D's have five orbitals that can hold 10 electrons, et cetera, et cetera. So because these are both N equals two, these are close in energy together, so they can mix. So notice, when I am an SP3 or an SPPP, I am 25% S, 75% resembling a P. Okay? It's just a mixing, and it's a rough ratio. So what does it actually look like? Well, we actually take, well, let's start with, let's just start with the, what, what boron does. If I take two p, elect, two p orbitals, leave one on hybridized, or leave it out there, and I mix just three, one s and two p's, notice I'm gonna be a third like an s, and two thirds like a p. And so it takes this two s and the two p, and it just mixes it into this trigonal planar geometry, because that's the farthest away three electron domains can be off the central core, okay? So that's an sp2, sp2, right? S, whoops, excuse me, s, p, p, all right? sp2 then has a little lobe out here and a bigger lobe here because again, it looks a lot like s, but it looks mostly like p. So it's gonna have a slight shape of a dumbbell, but it also is gonna be a little exaggerated to one side. So that's when we bring these all together, we think it looks something like that, okay? or that s and it still has a node because it has those p uh, that p influence okay now let's talk about methane methane my favorite atom is carbon what is what does this do how does this actually bring this together we know it's going to be the shape of a tetrahedron so i'm going to have a little bit of s 25 percent and i have quite a bit of, of p 75 percent when i mix those notice the four orbital set that mixes here's my n equals two it's going to mix, and it's going to be degenerate, or same energy. This will be an SPPP, or an SP cubed, or an SP3, okay? So it's one, two, three, four. What's the farthest away I can put those electron domains? What's the geometry? Tetrahedron. So that's why it is that I have a tetrahedron. So methane gas itself would then come in and it would say, okay, well, here's the way I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to take and I'm going to put one hydrogen. I'm going to have a lobe here and a big lobe here. I'm going to have a little lobe there and a big lobe there. I'm going to bring a big lobe out, put it back, and then I'm going to have a lobe into the blackboard in there. It's going to put a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here. And in here are going to be two electrons, one from carbon and one from hydrogen. So carbon's gonna have two, four, six, eight electrons, it's happy, and it puts those in a tetrahedron lattice. It's the farthest away that those can get, okay? So that's what we're thinking about with this idea of bonding, all right? So with that, we then see that we have really three different angles when we're talking about the P orbitals. That's what these mean, by the way. Remember, that's the, that's the orientation in space so X, Y, and Z wrote, that's what those stand for. So here's X, right? Here's Y, and here's Z, okay? So when I put those in three-dimensional space, I get this perfect tetrahedron of 109.5 degrees away from those lobes. Cool? Questions on that? Okay, I think it looks a little like that. Okay, if we move up into larger atoms or larger molecules. Let's say I have something that re like an IF5 or an SF6. So notice sulfur hexafluoride is SF6 and it has a lot of electrons. So it looks like this. Sulfur hexafluoride then puts a fluorine here, a fluorine back, a fluorine here, a fluorine back, a fluorine up, and a fluorine down. So there it is. But the question then is, what happens, I do it all, 
So that's uh, sulfur hexafluoride. So what, how does it actually have uh, 12 electrons around that sulfur? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Remember, it, viol it, it can violate the octet rule, sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, anything below. I can't emphasize this enough. The only four that don't violate the octet rule are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Okay? Most of the time, silicone is, is in that as well, but um, um, the other ones can do a lot of crazy fun things. Okay, so with that, what happens, what happens is if, I, if I'm a linear, then I'm gonna mix two, SP. If I'm trigonal planar, I'm three, so I'm gonna mix an S and two Ps. If I'm tetrahedral, I'm four, so I'm gonna mix an S and three Ps. If I'm trigonal bipyramidal, I'm gonna mix an S, three Ps, and a D, okay? And if I'm octahedral, I'm gonna mix and that's three Ps and two Ds, okay? And that's really, I, I don't make it any more complex than that. Um, it, it, we can complicate it if you want, but if you can just remember, we're really counting from two to six. That's what Vesper theory does for us. And, then, and again, the models that come from this are actually very predictable and we use them a lot. So you can see something that's an SP3D looks like this, all right? My equatorial plane and my axial plane on that. And then if you want something like iodine pentafluoride, which is gonna be have a molecular geometry of square pyramidal or square pyramid, you can see that here's the pyramid, okay? Here's that lone pair down there, but it just brings in its, its, uh, its fluorines uh, around, around like that, okay? Good? No, no, yeah, good? Now notice fluorine is, is in a P orbital, and that's because fluorine has its valence electrons in a P orbital, so that's what, more than likely, uh, the theory goes for, for what fluorine looks like, uh, uh, iodine pentafluoride looks like, okay? Again, with sulfur hexafluoride, SP3D2, okay? Again, equatorial plane, axial plane, but in this case, it's all symmetrical. So here, then, is the summary of everything that you should be up to speed with. You should know, the ge you should know your principal geometries, okay? You should know your molecular geometries that come from the principal geometries, you should know your, your hybridization right here, and you should be able to predict whether it's polar or not polar. Okay? Good. All right, let's take off and, and move on to um, double bonds and, and a couple other things here. All right? Okay, what happens when I leave off, uh, what, what happens when I leave off an orbital? So, Let's say I have a carbon over here, a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, and I'm s, 2s, 2p. And carbon brings its electrons in. Okay, so there's carbon, the ground state of carbon. So another carbon comes in. And it brings in its orbital, orbital set. Okay. So let's say this carbon, though, leaves one unhybridized. This one leaves one unhybridized. What happens to this carbon? We'll notice. Hey, guys. guys shh, shh, shh. Let's keep it down. Yeah. Well, so hold on. If this carbon, if this carbon has one, two, three electrons, right? It's going to mix those to a trigonal planar geometry, right? This carbon is going to mix those to a trigonal planar geometry. It's going to leave one electron unhybridized up here. That's what happens. So this carbon says, I can make three bonds, one, two, three. I can make three bonds, one, two, three. So carbon then has a lobe here, and a lobe here, and a lobe here that it can make bonds with. 
one, two, three electrons. One electron, one electron, one electron. See how that's working? One electron, one electron, one electron. But if it says, I want to bond to another carbon, this carbon here says, well, cool, I have, I have three lobes as well. Okay. I have an electron here, electron here, and hey, let's share. So we're going to share one of these. But it still has two other bonds that it can make. It can make another carbon, or it can put a hydrogen up here. Put a hydrogen up here, hydrogen brings its one in, hydrogen brings its one in, hydrogen brings its one in, hydrogen brings its one in. It's pretty happy. So we call these sigma bonds. This is a single bond. Sigma, 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 sigma. But here's the cool thing. I still have two electrons that are unhybridized. So this carbon and this carbon have one extra electron that they can share. So what they actually do is they actually have still this giant 2p orbital with one electron. And what happens, they share. Okay? And we call that a pi bond. That is a double bond. And so when we draw that, we would draw that molecule like this. And we would call that in organic chemistry an alkene. Okay? An alkene has sigma, 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 pi bond. And the pi bond is these p orbitals that are unhybridized from, oops, from carbon. So if I admit a model of that, this is where the Molly Mod model kit really does come into play. Notice this alkene. Okay, this is epi. It's the most simple alkene you can make. And so what happens, if you think about it this way, it's almost like the sigma bond in the middle is like the hot dog, and the pi bond is like the bun. Okay? And that's really what it's like. It really surrounds those electrons. And here's the crazy cool thing. You're going to learn that a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. These electrons really like to go be mischievous. Okay? They go do really fun reactions like SN2s and some really fun things that we'll see you'll get into in organic chemistry. Yes, Jane? So, if, so pi bonds are connected at those two places with the sharing. Yeah. So wouldn't it be more accurate with three? Why do they have just like two electrons? Two electrons? Oh, yeah, I know. I know, right? That's just convention because it does look like there's three bonds there. Here's the thing. This is the crazy thing. Remember, there is a node here because this is a p orbital. So it's a dumbbell. So here's the crazy thing. Those electrons are either here, 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 here. They never cross the node. So where are they really? They're all over the place, right? There's a big cloud. They never cross, but they're here and here. You comfortable with that? Because if I'm going to go from here to here, I'm going to walk through the node. <laughs> they don't. They, there's zero probability of finding them there in, in, that, in, that, in that node. So this is the, this is the theory of, of bringing this overlap idea in. And I have some cool pictures of these. This is, I like the model kits the best. I think hands-on just seeing these is, is pretty, pretty cool. Um, but again, there's just this overlap there. All right. So with that, we're going to begin to see that we just have this overlapping bonds, two electrons, opposite spin, share, and form a bond. Okay? So this is our bonding overlap or our bonding theory. And you can see that down here. All right. Okay, valence bond theory. Now, here's the cool thing. With head-to-head -head overlap, notice, notice right here, this is head to head, okay? This is not head to head, this is side to side, which is why we draw this kind of this cartoon of this, this being a big cloud of mixing. And, and a real, a better picture of this, if I were to draw it, it's more like that. A better picture of this would be something like this. That P orbital kind of gets distorted into something like that. That's the whole thing, it kind of blends in together. And we'll see that on Monday when we get into molecular orbital theory. Uh, again, it helps explain this, this bond overlap, okay? So again, there's a symmetry level with the cylinders head-to-head -head like that, okay? 
pi bonds are the p orbitals overlapping side by side. So that's why you see this drawing up here. Here's my big p orbital, right? But there's a mixing, there's an overlap between the p orbitals. And there's two electrons in there. Whether they're here or here, doesn't matter. There's two electrons in, in all four of those, those orbitals, okay? So we call those pi bonds, double bonds. They're a side to side overlap. And again, the electron density is side to side. Very important bond. Um, because again, those two electrons are nucleophil, uh, uh, they're a Lewis base, and they want to go mis be mischievous. Yeah. So you'll never see it's like a quadruple bond because you only have like two planes. Um, there are quad bonds, they're rare, and I think it's because you have to go out the D orbitals and they go out beyond the P's. So you're not actually adding. No, no, and, and so like if I made an alkyne, so if we did a, if we did an alkyne, check this out. Right, here's, here's the alkyne, and I, I mentioned this briefly. So it's a sigma and two pi's, right? So what it does, this carbon and this carbon say, oh, let's leave two unhybridized, okay? So we'll, we'll hybridize an S and we'll hybridize a P. So then it still has its sigma bond and it shares with its sigma bond, two electrons, there's your sigma. But now it does something really cool. It has that P orbital here in the plane of the whiteboard, and it mixes and says global bond here. But now, because that's the plan of board, it brings another pair out at you. So it brings it out at you and back, out at you and back, and they mix back there and out here. And, and, a, and a triple bond, instead of it being a hot dog with buns, becomes a pig in a blanket. And the electrons completely circle the hot dog. Okay, and that's a triple bond. And that's an SP. Hybridized orbital. Yeah. To go to a quad, then you're right. We ran out of room, didn't we? So what, what do we do? Because I believe there are. I have to ask Dr. Harris again. That's outside of, of, of my expertise, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Is there another question? No. Okay. So orbital overlap with these. And so again, here's our triple bond, single bond, sigma bond, single bond, pi bond, double bond. Okay. It has a, what we call a bond order of one because there's one bond between those two. When we go to multiple bonds, you're still gonna have one sigma bond, like I have right here, that's a sigma bond, and a pi bond, okay? And it's gonna have a bond order of two. There are two bonds, eight electrons, be, or uh, uh, four electrons between that, 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 those two carbons. When we go to nitrogen, notice nitrogen, Nitrogen is a cool molecule. It brings six electrons and shares. Two are pi, one is a sigma. And so it's going to have a bond order of three. Very strong bond as we saw back in our electron, uh, th our, thermo, our thermo bond uh, section. Okay. And so if we look at something like uh, C2H4, ethene, that's this right here. I'll just show you a better graphic than my, my it's hard sometimes to do stuff in two dimensions on a whiteboard. I prefer to lecture on a whiteboard just because it's more interactive than my kids at the Grand Canyon. But in this case, I think it's the three-dimensionality of it works a lot better. So here you see the sigma bonds, okay? So carbon has these three, these three electrons in an sp2, spp, sp2. So sp2, 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 sp2. Brings the hydrogens in to satisfy those electrons in the sp2 hybridized uh, molecular orbitals. But now what does it do with these two unhybridized p orbitals? Well, my graphic looks like this. This graphic shows it a lot better. You can see that they mix, all right? And what we're gonna see on Monday is they mix in two different ways. There is a constructive bonding and there's an anti or non-constructive and anti-bonding. All right, so stay with me on that because that's where it gets a little bit fun. And that's on Monday, okay? So we do have to venture into enough molecular over theory so, so that when you get to organic chemistry, you kind of understand how this all works at the core level. So here you have those two p orbitals, and they mix into what we're gonna see, a bonding and a non-bonding, okay? We cool? So that is multiple bonds, all right? When you look at something like formaldehyde, again, this is an sp2 carbon, this is an sp2 oxygen. I know it's an sp2 oxygen, 
because it has three electron domains and three is SP2, okay? Okay, or SPP, all right? So a sigma bond between the oxygen and the carbon, one of them, and a shared pi electron, the, 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 the uh, uh, bun around the sigma bond. So this is what we believe formaldehyde to look like, okay? And the really cool thing about formaldehyde is that carbon is really a good electrophile, meaning a nucleophile will go attack it. And that's how we take formaldehyde and we actually react it and make cool things like amides and, and, and such. All right, so again, very practical way to view chemistry. Um, and you can see that oxygen still has its two lone pairs out there. And, and so if you made it, if you turn, if you turn this into, if you turn this into formaldehyde, which we could do it pretty easily, I just assume that's red, not black, because black is simply carbon. Just remove those. There's what formaldehyde looks like. Okay, that kind of cool. So formaldehyde is carbon oxygen, sigma bond, pi bond, two lone pairs on oxygen. Therefore, that oxygen is still trigonal planar. Carbon has its two hydrogens, and it's carbon trigonal planar with a double bond. It doesn't hydrogen bond. There's only three entities of hydrogen bond. Right. It could accept. It, it, it's a hydrogen bond acceptor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Formaldehyde, yes. It's incredibly soluble in water, yeah, which is one reason why we use it for pig, uh, pig, uh, 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 preserving tissue. Yeah. Okay. So. Here's that triple bond I was talking about, right here, okay? And again, you can see the sigma bond stays in the middle. That's the hot dog, if you will, in our, in our cheesy analogy. It puts one, one pair of electrons in the, uh, in the plane of the, of, the, uh, of the screen, and has one pair coming out and going back. And so you can see when they mix, they literally form this cylinder around them. And what we'll talk about with that cylinder is there's a, there's a magnetic current associated with that. And so when we get into nuclear magnetic resonance, you're gonna see that something really happens special with that hydrogen versus these hydrogens, okay? And that's the fun thing when we start to see the practical side of the foundation that we're setting in general chemistry, so higher levels of organic chemistry and biology make, make more sense, all right? Now, I also like to put this in because you know my whole, frustration with Lewis dot structures is it's not a complete theory, right? We have to have a patch on it, we call the patch resonance. So here's where resonance, you actually get to see why resonance makes sense, but it looks better when you start to think about it in molecular orbitals, all right? So here is a delocalized, these P orbitals are delocalized across the nitrogen and the oxygen. So what we really think happens though, is it doesn't look like this. You don't have nodes here. More than likely what's happening is we have the, nit uh, the nitrate looks like that. So that's why when we see this level of theory, the, the whole idea of resonance makes a little bit more sense and why that is the patch that's put on the theory. So if you think about this, if I take the nitrate, so if I take nitrate, There's nitrate. And what is the charge on nitrate? What is it? Negative one. Let's, let's, let's do the Lewis dot structure for nitrate. Okay, nitrate. How many, how many electrons for nitrogen? How many electrons for three oxygens? So that equals a total of 24 electrons, right? If you look at this, I've got two, four, six, so I've got eight, 16, 24 electrons, okay? But here's what we really think overall happens, all right? We end up with all these crazy resonance structures. So nitrate, if you look at it this way, 
But there's a problem with that. What's the problem with that structure? Oh, surely. What's the problem with that structure? Yell it out. Yeah, nitrogen has too many bonds, okay? Too many electrons. So here's what we think is really going on. We bring this in and we kick it out. Oh, that's what we're talking about. So nitrogen then can have this form. Okay? And they resonate, but it doesn't look like this. And it doesn't look like that. It looks like that. You see how this works? It's that magnetic lava lamp thing. All right, because those both look still pretty bad, even though if you calculated the formal charge on nitrogen, it would be somewhat happy. And that's probably a good exercise to do. What is the formal charge on this nitrogen? Well, how do we determine that? It's five because it's five minus half of eight is four. So nitrogen here is a plus one. Oxygen is six minus six minus one. So it is negative one. Oxygen is six minus six minus one is negative one. Well, that's kind of a weird molecule because that's why overall the nitrate is a negative one because those cancel and you're left with one. Huh? And the crazy thing is more than likely what this thing looks like is this here. It puts that negative charge delocalized between two oxygens. So when I make sodium nitrate, sodium will just sit out there between two oxygens. And that's why I like this version or this theory because this helps to explain better than the Lewis dot resonance um, um, theory, okay? All right, any questions on that? We got it? Doing good? Yes? Yeah, which is why it does. So even this isn't satisfying because they're all equally sharing that negative one charge. So it's almost like, we're gonna get like this, it's almost like you have a negative third, negative third, negative third. That's not cool, <laughs> right? We don't like that because we can't draw good little Lewis dot structures that we were taught early on. Yeah, Hunter. So, uh, the actual thing of keeping these molecules together is the attraction between the charge. Attraction between electrons, which is, which is not cool. Electrons don't like each other. Right. Somehow in a bond, they love each other. So you two. What's that? Can't use maximum. No. And, and I, don't think, I don't think the love of electrons comes a full circle until we get into molecular orbital theory. That, that to me begins to explain it because again, that's a mathematical solution to this. This is more visual, right? This is helpful because we can make models and we can use these models to predict. And you want a theory to be able to predict, and we can. But there's more to it. There's actually a lot more to it. The other thing is, could the molecules be formed once the sodium is there? Yeah. If there's a partial negative one. Yeah. Is that partial negative That's probably, yeah. Fine. Right, right, and it, and it probably, um, because, because of the way nitrogen has this negative one charge, or excuse me, positive one charge, more than likely, if you, I, I would I'd be curious to see what it looks like in an x-ray crystal, because I would, I would venture to guess that those oxygens kind of bend a little, and sodium sits there, and they're all equally sharing, would be my guess of what the, the crystal structure would look like. Yeah. Okay, did we get enough today? Are we full? Are we can call it easy or we can keep going? So we can complicate it. Is that good for now? Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, have a really nice weekend.
Um, Monday is a big day, so I'm supposed to, from my, folks from my dean and the GPAA remind you that we have class on Monday and Tuesday, we get Wednesday off. Okay? I'm supposed to remind you of that. Sounds good. <laughs> oh, and if you need files, grab a bag. Have a good weekend.